This is a true story, first recounted in a series of lectures I gave at the Hague Academy of International Law in the summer of 2022. As a participant in parts of this story, I am not an independent observer and understand that events may be seen from different angles with different interpretations. I try to present a personal account in a manner that is fair and balanced. The story, which is little known and deserves a broader audience, actually comprises a number of interwoven tales. One relates to the International Court of Justice in The Hague and its role in the gradual demise of colonialism, with a focus ultimately on the case of Mauritius. Another is more personal, my own evolving relationship with the world of international law. And a third, the beating heart of the book, is the tale of Lisby Elysee, the wrongs done to her and other Chagossians, and their quest for justice that continues to this day. I've sought to capture what Madame Elysee shared with me during many hours we spent together, going over the text and the events to accord with her recollections. I hope that our collaboration and friendship meet her aspiration. Our backgrounds are different, yet our paths connected through processes of law and litigation that have gradually closed the curtain on the colonial era into which Madame Elysee was born and lived and in which my working life has been cast. Thank you, Philippe. Um, I want to start, I, I think the way that this kind of conversation will go is that we'll throw up the three strands and, and kind of return to each one. But let's go first to the beating heart of the book, as you say. Who is Madame Elise? I need to just give you a tiny bit of context. Where is the Chagos Archipelago? It's, some of you may know, I don't know. It is in the Indian Ocean. It's a group of 58 islands, hundreds of thousands of square kilometers a British colony, part of Mauritius since 1814, until 1965, when it was uh, separated, detached from the British colony of Mauritius, because the Americans wanted one of the islands, Diego Garcia, to serve as a military base. To achieve that, the British took all of the islands, created a new colony, their last colony in Africa, the last colony they ever created, called the British Indian Ocean Territory, gave independence to Mauritius in 1968, and subsequently removed the entire population of the Chagos Archipelago and forcibly deported them to Mauritius and the Seychelles. And Lisby Elysee is one of the 2,000 people who was deported, born in 1953, a remarkable individual, black, descended from enslaved people, cannot read, cannot write, a human being of great intelligence and dignity and spirit and courage, and who was the star witness in the case that is the subject of this book at the International Court of Justice. And, and that's really how you start. I mean, you start, you kind of set this up, and then you you give the transcript of her testimony. Can you tell us about what that was like being there and, and kind of what she was saying? So, so the case that, that eventually got to the court in 2018 was sent there by the General Assembly of the United Nations. And it's a court where the only voices that are heard are the voices of states, governments. But we on the legal team for Mauritius felt that given what had happened to the Chagossian community, the judges really had to hear from the Chagossians themselves and not hear the story from us. They had spent years litigating with some success and that litigation threw out a lot of the material which allowed us to take the case to the International Court of Justice with their input and with their support. Having decided that we wanted the judges, or the judges had to hear a Chagossian voice, we went through the exercise of deciding which one. and from my own experience as a litigator at the international court it was pretty clear that a female voice is likely to have greater resonance with the judges and so we interviewed a range of people men and women all in their 60s and 70s all of whom had been forcibly deported and wanted to go back to the islands from which they'd been removed in violation of international law we said and lisby was 
remarkable. I mean, she told a remarkable story. She told it with incredible strength and force. She's a storyteller, very understated. And because she can't read or write, we couldn't do what would normally happen, which is have her stand at the podium, address the judges, read from a prepared text. So we asked the court for the permission for her to pre-record. Um, that might seem a little tough, but the reason was you only get a couple of hours before the court. And one of the things we loved about Lisby was once she started talking, she didn't stop, which was great, but we only had two hours. So we decided we'll record it. And that was complex. Um, in the end, she, there were a number of takes of her statement. We chose one. It was three minutes and 47 seconds long. You can see it on the web. It's an incredibly powerful statement. And that, there was a really interesting issue that arose, the, a debate amongst the Mauritians and the lawyers and the Chagossians. Right at the end, having made her statement, I don't know if you've seen it, she, she picks up her hand and she brushes her hand across her eyes and she weeps. And we had a very lengthy debate. I'm talking about months with very strong views in different directions. Do we cut before we get to that moment or do we include that? And those who wanted to cut, the logic, and it was a strong logic, was some of the judges won't like the use of emotion to try effectively to manipulate them. On the other hand, to cut her was to disrespect who she was and what she had done. And so, in the end, we decided, and it was absolutely the right call, to include just the tape as it was. And and I know subsequently the judges said to me, "No, that was fine." That was, but it was, it was a really complex debate. I mean, look, the issue in the courtroom was very complex. Let's just cut straight to the chase about what's going on here. There were issues of, you know, white savior. The white lawyers come along and sort this issue out. There was issue of gender. There was issue of identity. It was a hugely complex experience, not just for her, but for those like me on the other side who were trying to work out what's the right thing to do, how do we handle this, what's correct. And the judges from 14 different countries and 14 different backgrounds, 14 different parts of the world, will have lived this experience in very different ways. And that moment, the three minutes, 47 seconds when she spoke, I will never forget. It was extraordinary. Yeah, so let's go to this the second piece of the tale, which is your relationship and your career to the world of international law. You came to represent Mauritius at The Hague, as you say, during this time, and you write, I made my way to the podium. I had addressed the court many times before, yet on this occasion was somehow more anxious. Can you tell us how you came to litigate the Chagos matter, what ultimately distinguished this case from others, and why there was this feeling of anxiety? I mean, maybe you can expound upon what you just said. So the case came to me by accident. I mean, I wear a number of hats. I'm an academic. I teach at London University and in the States, and I work as a barrister. I have subsequently started writing books for a bigger audience. In April 2010, actually the very same month that I received an invitation to go to a place I had never heard of called Lviv in Ukraine, and we have one friend here from Lviv right now. Um, I address that to you. Um, I know Lviv very well now. Everyone else of you in the audience knows Lviv, I think, also. Um, but that very same month, I went skiing with my brother in a French resort called the Voreaz. And I just remember the moment very well. I was on the chairlift and my phone rang and I'm really terrified if I look at my telephone while I'm on a chairlift that I'm going to drop it, which has happened. And so, but but the number was like plus two, three, zero. Where is that? And I'm just curious, like, what? So I, you know, I'm sort of struggling with my gloves and trying to make sure I don't drop it. And, and it's the prime minister's office in Mauritius. Would I be willing to speak to the prime minister now um, to talk about this place called Chagos? I'd never heard of Chagos. I'd heard of Diego Garcia because it was used as a rendition site in the period after September the 11th. And there was a big American base there. And the bombing of Iraq in 2003 started from Diego Garcia, but Chagos I'd never heard of. So I spoke to the PM and he said, well, you know, we've been fighting for these islands for 50 years and now the British, we don't need to go into too much detail, have done something that really pisses us off. And we want to hire someone who will take on the British government. This is a big difference between Britain and France. As an English barrister, it is totally fine 
to act against your own country. No one has a problem with that. It happens the whole time. As a Frenchman, I'm both French and British, you don't act against the French state. Um, it's just not a done thing. I, I just actually mentioned that by un, I'm now 62 years old. And for the first time in my life, I've just been invited to a meeting at the Quai d'Orsay to talk about something substantive. And I, I told them how nice it was finally to be invited, given that I'd acted against France in the nuclear test case in 1995, uh, when Jacques Chirac in his wisdom decided he would start doing nuclear testing again in the South Pacific, unbelievably. So that was how it began. And um, it, I was curious. I read myself into it. I was shocked that I knew nothing about the Chagos Archipelago, shocked that I knew nothing about Chagossians, made me reflect as I write in the book about what sort of education did I have. And of course, as I describe in the book, as probably your education was and my children's education was 30 years after mine, just about the glories and greatness of the United Kingdom fantastic colonial empire, nothing about enslavement, nothing about the miseries, just fantastic. I actually went back and I describe it in the book to my school history book from 1973. I found it because I keep everything because I come, my mum's a refugee and when you come from a refugee family, you, you keep everything you hold. So I had it, Geoffrey Treese, this is your century. And it had a chapter chapter eight called Sunset on Empire. And I apologize for what I'm about to say, but it comes straight out of the book. And it was shocking. It began with a comparison between the magnificent Viscount Mountbatten, the last viceroy of India, who was this sort of splendid creature, compared to the new bloke, reference to Mr. Gandhi, skinny, vegetarian, pacifist, and I apologize for what I'm about to say, looks like a monkey with glasses. Okay, that's what we got. That's what we got in 1972. So is it any surprise that people like me, been educated, been to good schools, been to good universities, had great teachers, just knew nothing about the real history of our country. So it was a shock. And he was calling you too because he had counted your work through your book on Iraq. I think I'd written a book which was a sort of transition book. It was before East West Street, which reached a much bigger audience. But I published a book with Penguin in 2005, complaining about the illegality of the war in Iraq. And it was called Lawless World. And he wanted a, an English barrister who wasn't scared to take on the English. In fact, I don't think there's any English barrister who's scared to take on the English because it's just part of our way that we operate. We love taking on the British. It's fantastic. So you write, and I really like the sentence because I think it, it, it reverberates throughout the book. You write, every act and every written word is capable of having consequences, however unexpected or unintended. But we know that from life, don't we? We know that we have a conversation and it'll be taken in a way that wasn't intended and will open doors. There are many aspects of this story and indeed East West Street and the Rat Line that reflects but the single moment here just to share with you in terms of unintended consequences so britain basically allows the united states to use diego garcia to bomb iraq britain allows the united states to use diego garcia as a stop-off point on extraordinary rendition and torture flights and this then emerges into the public domain much to the embarrassment of the British government, including someone who is considered to be a progressive and a liberal, David Miliband. Um, many of you will know him, I'm sure a very decent person, but it's embarrassing. So they concoct this fantastic idea, which is to turn the entire Chagos archipelago into a marine protected area, not just a, a, a marine protected area, but the greatest marine protected area in the whole world, the largest one, even bigger than any one that an American would create. So the Brits, you know, are really sort of feeling good about themselves. So this is announced. It really pisses off the Mauritians who have not been consulted. And they say, you don't have any right to do this. This is our territory. It's our land. It's the Chagossian home. You have no right to do this. And it coincides with WikiLeaks. It coincides with the release of millions of pieces of paper 
which are searchable, which means anyone can type in Chagos or British Indian Ocean Territory and find the eight documents out of the millions. And they are shocking because one of the documents is a cable from London to Washington from the American embassy in which the American diplomats describe their encounter with the British diplomat responsible for the British Indian Ocean Territory, uh, in which he you know, extols the virtues of the marine protected area, and then says, as they record him in quotation marks, the great thing about this marine protected area is it means that the man Fridays will never be able to go back. End of quote. I mean, 19... 2009 and they're still writing like in the 70s like in the 19th century like in the 18th century i mean it's completely shocking and this really upset the Trigossians, and this really upset the mauritians and in this way the sort of butterfly wings effect david miliband's well-intended pro-environmental act brought catastrophe to the united kingdom because it was the catalyst that led to you know, the creation of a legal team and the beginnings of the litigation and the moment when Liz B. Elise stood before the 14 judges of the International Court and said to them, this is what they did to me. And maybe you could just fill us in, Philippe, and you mentioned that they were forcibly removed, but what's happened in the meantime? Some of them have stayed you know, nearby, some of them have been moved to the UK, um, they're agitating, they're, they're calling the, the UK government to go back. Um, just fill us in on, on that piece of the history. It's really complicated. It is an extraordinary complex community, first generation, the people who were born there, second generation, third generation, fourth generation. So we're now talking several thousand people located in Mauritius, in Seychelles, in Réunion, a small community in France, and then a, a community, not huge, but mostly third, fourth generation, living in a small town in England called Crawley. And you might ask yourself, how on the earth did they end up in Crawley? It's horrendous. They ended up in Crawley because some of the Chagossians were given British nationality. They flew to Gatwick Airport with no money, they were not met by anyone, and they lived in Gatwick Airport for two weeks and didn't know what to do, so they went to the nearest town, which was Crawley, and then created a community. The whole of the Chagossian community is deeply divided. Some wanted to be part of Mauritius, some wanted to be part of the United Kingdom, some wanted to be its own country. And the complexities among the Chagossians is something that I think someone like me as an outsider has to be respectful of. I'm counsel for Mauritius. Mauritius has associated itself with the Chagossians who favor a return, if you like, to Mauritius. But many of the Chagossians in the UK will say to you, look, we don't want to be under Mauritian control. That is essentially a Hindu population. We are the lowest of the low. Why would we want that? It's even worse than being in Britain. So it, it's quite a complex and delicate situation. And, um, and that is being navigated right now. And can you also describe, because you described this in the book, there are some kind of measly handouts that the UK government gives to the upplanted, replanted Chagossians in the UK. There's a bit of money. There are these things called the heritage visits. I mean, can you talk about that side? Um, it's shocking. It's it's a few hundred pounds here or there. Um, it's really not written in a great light, it has to be said. Um, the Americans were not opposed to some Chagossians remaining on all the other islands apart from Diego and Garcia. But the logic of the British position, this comes a bit to the international part of the story just to explain, is that all of this happened in the mid-1960s, at which point there was a move towards decolonization. And decolonization was reflected in a resolution of the General Assembly adopted in 1960, Resolution 1514, which basically said people have a right to self-determination. They have a right to determine for themselves the conditions under which they will live. 
and inherent in the right to self-determination is a principle of territorial integrity. You can't chop off a bit of a colony when you decide to give it independence, unless those residents and permanent inhabitants of the colony express their consent to that happening. So what the British did, hoist by their own logical petard, was to determine that all the Chagossians living there in 1965 were not residents of Chagos, they were contract laborers brought into work, and therefore they had no right to express a view. Some of the contract laborers who I know were three months old when they were forcibly deported. I mean, it really is, the more you get into it, the more shocking it is. And Britain being Britain has not been able to come to terms with its past in any way. So the idea of apologizing or repairing, you know, the British are very good with words. So what they'll say is, ad nauseam, we regret the manner in which the Chagossians were removed. Now, when you sort of unbundle what they're basically saying, is, oh, actually, we don't object. It wasn't a mistake to get rid of them. It's just how it was done. No apology, no reparation. And right now they're in a real mess because two weeks ago, as you may know, Human Rights Watch brought out a report characterizing this entire episode as a crime against humanity. Forcible deportation was a crime against humanity from Nuremberg days. And the um, upshot is that Human Rights Watch, for the first time in its history, has leveled the charge of crimes against humanity against the United States and the United Kingdom. It has never happened before, which is pretty interesting. I want to go to um, back to the case, back to the 21st century while well, you were there, and we'll go back to that kind of at the end of our conversation. Um, but so this this WikiLeaks document emerges and you write this was the kind of document that stiffens the backbone. And then you depart on this twin track ap approach to litigation. Can you tell us about the two pronged attack? And also, can you describe how, as you as you say in, the, in your note to the reader, how there's also the changing context of international law, which itself is becoming, you know, more diverse and, and that's changing while Britain is not changing. So you've all had this experience. There are certain things you come across or read or, or, or watch or see that really outrage you, that, that cross a line and that, I remember that WikiLeaks, seeing that WikiLeaks document, it was shameful. And I think that you know, already we really had the sense of a sense of shame that we knew nothing about this story, a sense of shame of being British and having, as a British person by inaction somehow, not colluded, but just done nothing about it, just accepted it. Um, and so I think it just helped create a sense amongst all of the lawyers. When you have these legal teams, they're very international. They come from all over the world. They're very diverse, gender, race, color, nationality, everything. It's, you know, that's how you have to construct a team because the 14 judges at the International Court come from all over the world. So basically a bunch of Brits standing up and talking before the court does not resonate with judges who come from Mexico or Somalia, as would counsel and advocates who come from those countries. You've got to have a very international team to forge an international view of what has happened. So in designing the legal strategy, we were faced, we don't have time to get into all the legal niceties, and I'm sure most of you have no interest in the legal niceties. It's not a legal textbook, I promise you. It's a, it's a story. Um, we faced one particular problem. The government of Mauritius really wanted to go to the International Court of Justice because that is in The Hague. It's the principal judicial organ of the United Nations. It's the place that would get the most attention. But there was no route to going there because the United Kingdom had not accepted the jurisdiction of the court for a bilateral dispute brought by Mauritius against the UK. The only way we could have got there was for the General Assembly to send the question as what is called as an advisory opinion on decolonization. But in 2010, 
we all took the view, the government of Mauritius, the Chivasians, the lawyers, there's just no way we're going to persuade the General Assembly membership, the UN membership, Mauritius versus UK and US. To do that, we wouldn't get a majority. So we went instead another route under an obscure convention called the Law of the Sea Convention, arguing essentially that the United Kingdom had no title over Chagos, and so the creation of marine protected area violated Mauritius's rights under the Law of the Sea Convention, right to fish, right to be informed about environmental matters and so on and so forth. We won part of the case, but we lost on the principal issue who had sovereignty because the majority three judges ruled a law of the sea tribunal has no power to express views of who has sovereignty over land. But two of the judges dissented, the German and the Tanzanian, and they produced a very, very strong and beautifully written dissent in which they also said, and we conclude, that Mauritius is sovereign over Chagos, that the whole thing was unlawful, the deportations were unlawful, and for the first time we had two judges on the side of Mauritius. That then caused the new Prime Minister of Mauritius, who had actually been at the meeting back in the 60s when the decision to separate Chagos from Mauritius was taken and had always objected to it, to instruct us to find a way to get to the International Court of Justice. And we thought, you know, how on earth are we going to do that? I mean, how do you persuade the majority? You know, Mauritius population, population one million taking on two permanent members of the Security Council, and then a miracle fell from the skies. Brexit. Brexit was fantastic for us. I mean, I'm totally opposed to Brexit, but on this account, it was brilliant because Britain's international authority collapsed. All of a sudden, all the 27 other member states of the EU said, oh, it's not our problem. You're on your own. Bye-bye, Britain. And they just bailed. And so when it came up at the General Assembly, um, Britain and the United States between them persuaded only 14 countries out of 200 to oppose the resolution. And off it went to the International Court of Justice. It was like a little miracle. I mean, the second miracle we had, I would say, was the identity of the British Foreign Minister. Um, Truly, Boris Johnson, one of the most disgusting people on planet Earth, a vile, misogynist, racist, misogynic, horrible individual who wrote articles in newspapers that went down very well with readers of the Daily Telegraph and the Daily Mail, referring to people in Africa. And again, I apologize. I'm just quoting what he said. Pickaninnies with watermelon smiles. That is what Boris Johnson writes. And that goes down brilliantly with Daily Telegraph readers. It does not go down brilliantly at the United Nations. And everyone had read them. And so the Brits go around lobbying in the name of Boris Johnson. And they're like, no, I don't think so. We don't, you know. And so it's like 15 own goals by the United Kingdom. And the matter went off to the court. And at the court, we, we had another piece of good fortune, which was the identity of the president. Um, a remarkable jurist who knows Paris very well. He had been the legal advisor at UNESCO for many years, a fantastic jurist, good Abdullaki Yusuf from Somalia, um, a black African. And I can't help but think that that was not unhelpful. You know, if we had had a European Brit and American, maybe, maybe it wouldn't have gone in a different way. But Lisby, the conversation that impressed me the most, right at the end of the proceeding, you go back to get the decision. And we were incredibly anxious. We really cared about this case. This wasn't, you know, it's legal professionals wanting to win. Really, really cared about this case. It was emblematic about the nature of the international legal order, the rule of law, the mistreatment of a particular community essentially because of their color, as the Chagossians would say to us, I think with real force, if we had been white, this would never have happened to us. And I think that's right. And I remember saying to Lisby after the decision, were you anxious? She said, I was anxious until Mr. President came in. I said, why, what happened? He said, we looked at each other. And I knew from the way he looked at me that it was going to be fine. And it was words spoken with tenderness and intelligence and 
And I just said to her, well, you could have told me before, <laughs> which she hadn't done, because um, we were incredibly anxious. But it went fine, and the judges ruled unanimously that Chagos belonged to Mauritius. I mean, there was one dissent, but not on the merits on jurisdiction. The American judge, who was a very good judge, uh, just said the court shouldn't have decided the case, but she didn't say it belonged to Britain. And so in effect, it's a decision without dissent, which gives it enormous force. I think there are two other important pieces in this story, essentially of Britain in decline as it clings on to its colonial legacy, which is that it's losing judges, not only in The Hague, but also on the International International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Can you talk about these two? Yeah. I have read this book well. This, this is a sort of personally delicate matter for me. I'll talk about the judge at the International Court. Um, Britain has always had a judge at the International Court of Justice ever since the institution in effect was created in 1922. And the incumbent as of 2017, when all of this got to the International Court of Justice, was actually my teacher at university and someone I had a reasonably good relationship with. I mean, we looked at the world differently, but nevertheless, um, you know, uh, there was a there was a relationship, a decent relationship. And um, his and I, it was very delicate telling this story in the book because there's essentially a, a, a conflict here between my different worlds. Um, you don't write about certain things as an academic. Uh, one of the things, for example, I put in the book, which I've been told off ad nauseum by, by various people in this wonderful country, uh, I don't mention the judge, but I mention the moment in the nuclear weapons advisory opinion case in 1995 when the Attorney General of Samoa. Um, complained, I just said, before I address the subject before the court, let me just say how outraged my government and my country and all my citizens are that France is resuming nuclear testing in the South Pacific. And at that point, many of us observed the French judge take off his earphones, put them on the table and sort of sit there with cross arms looking extremely cross, which of course you just don't do as a judge. I, I didn't mention his name, but he's very famous in France. That has not gone down well. And as an academic international lawyer, you'd be expected not to put that in a book. You wouldn't be expected to write that up. And but as, as a journalist, you would be completely stupid to miss out on that. As a journalist or a writer of what the Germans call literary nonfiction, you need to tell stories and you need to say what you saw and what happened with the British judge at the International Court of Justice who unfortunately was also just about the only British international lawyer who thought the war in Iraq was legal and was used in that way by the British government to help sign off on that war. Um, he got voted off the International Court of Justice, a sort of combination of Iraq, Brexit, and Chagos. Um, and and that, uh, I had really mixed feelings about this. On the one hand, he's actually a very good international lawyer and a very good judge. On the other hand, for Mauritius, if we had a choice between a British judge or an Indian judge, you knew <laughs> you would want sitting on the International Court of Justice and the world of politics at the UN is brutal. So I described that, and again, I think a number of people would rather I had not included that in the book, but it was right to include it. And in part, I mean, my audience, you know, is a broad audience, but one of the audiences I write for is that group of young international lawyers who are coming into the world of international law, who read textbooks and treatises, and frankly have no idea how it really works from those textbooks and treatises. And I think they need to know how it really works. So for the first time, but in other words, for the first time, no English judge first time in the history of the international court no british judge they lost their judge on the tribunal of the law of the sea because of a vote on iraq and um this is an era of frankly you know declining authority in the world and there seems to be in london tremendous difficulty of coming to terms with that i mean there's one of the things that i've learned in this experience more than in others is the gulf that exists between the way Britain sees itself in the world and the way others in the world see Britain. And that gulf is very large right now. I, I don't celebrate 
that fact, I think it's tragic. I think it would be wonderful if the United Kingdom came to terms with it past, for example, as Germany has done. I'm not thinking only in relation to the Holocaust. I'm thinking of the decision a few months ago last year by Germany to recognize what it had done in German Southwest Africa against the Herero population as a genocide and to say it was wrong, it was a crime, we apologize, and we would like to try to find a way to recompense you for that. The British don't want to open that door, even on Chagos, because of course, once that door is open, you can imagine in terms of colonies around the world and in terms of enslavement, what they fear will follow. And let's speak frankly, it will follow. And it's right that it should follow. That conversation needs to be had, that engagement needs to be had. And those in power today in Britain don't want to open that door. What about France? <laughs> I think France is on a twin track with the United Kingdom, but in different ways. I'm, a, I mean, I grew up in Britain. I didn't grow up in France, so I'm not as attuned to the situation in France, but I do follow it pretty closely, particularly, for example, in relation to North Africa and Algeria and these kinds of stories. One thing that has sort of entertained me in the way this book has been received is that in a sense, it's been better received in France than in Britain. I think I predicted that with my English publisher, actually. I, I said to Jenny, I can imagine that the French will just love a book that is exceptionally bashing of the United Kingdom, whereas the United Kingdom perhaps might be a bit more resistant. And in the United Kingdom, it's really interesting. If you write books about Nazis, which I have done, you get Every newspaper in the country wants to extract the book, wants to do an interview with you, wants to, you know, when you write a book about British mistreatment of those it has colonized, the level of interest, it doesn't drop to zero, but it drops pretty significantly. And, and what is, what I found pretty entertaining was the way in which certain newspapers, let's take an example, the Daily Telegraph, treated this book they couldn't actually give it a bad review they would you know they had to accept it had some literary merit it had some interest and so it got a sort of you know half-heartedly decent review but it was the headline that i just totally loved the headline was britain is not like nazi germany and i'm thinking this book has nothing about Nazis in it. Like, who chose that headline? And it was a reference back to East West Street and the Rat Line. And here's a bloke who writes about Nazis, and now he's written about British colonial rule. And they were obviously feeling a bit defensive, the sub-editors who do the, the thing. But it was that was, I thought, was very indicative of, 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 of an inability. I think, I think there are equivalent books to be written about about France, plainly, there are, there are equivalent books to be written. I have to give real credit to the French judge on the international court. I must say, we did not count on the French judge's vote in favor of Mauritius, but we got it. Um, and France, of course, has its own history with its colonies, including in particular Mayotte, which is not dissimilar to the situation of Chagos and Mauritius, but the French judge voted um, you know, with 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 everyone else. So, uh, real credit to an independent French judge. Maybe, maybe we can get more into this and to the audience questions. Um, this will be my last question, which is that you end the book with a quote from Césaire. Um, he writes, "A civilization that plays fast and loose with its principles is a dying civilization." Apart from acknowledging the Chagos uh, story, what would it look like for you for Britain to reckon with its colonial legacy and slough this off? and really enter the 21st century, as you say, Germany has, as other countries have? Very few countries have, actually. I mean, I think Germany is extremely rare as being a country that has done that. Has done that. France hasn't done it, the US hasn't done it. Um, I'm thinking of Iraq and Vietnam and various, various other things. So perhaps to answer that, it's worth just briefly mentioning what's happened subsequently. The British get the decision from the court, then not exactly jubilant about it, it then goes to the General Assembly of the United Nations, which adopts an overwhelming resolution. British and American support goes down to just four countries voting in favour. Australia, Hungary, 
Israel and the Maldives. The rest of the world I, overwhelmingly votes in favor of the resolution. We accept the decision of the International Court. Chagos is part of Mauritius. Chagossians are allowed to return immediately and Britain must leave by November 2019. What does Britain do? Britain sticks two fingers up at the decision and says, no, we're going to tough it out. National security, there's the American base. We've got to protect ourselves here. We've got to look after this place. And that was the position until November the 3rd, just a few months ago, a few weeks ago, when the foreign secretary announced that Britain would start negotiations with Mauritius to... Um, reach an agreement on the exercise of sovereignty over the Chagos archipelago on the basis of international law. And you ask yourself the question, was the change some huge change of principle? No, absolutely not. It's about Ukraine. And you'll be thinking to yourself, what has this got to do with Ukraine? It's very simple. Britain goes around the world asking countries from around the world, including Africa, to support it in its, in my view, legitimate effort to remove Russia from its colonization, occupation, illegal activities in relation to Ukraine, and reasonable African prime ministers, presidents, foreign secretaries, ambassadors say, hang on, let me see if I've understood this correctly. You want us to help you remove Russia from its illegal occupation of Ukraine, but you want to continue your illegal occupation of Africa. No, fuck off. And that's what's happened. That is what's happened. I've had it from, you know, I do a lot of work in Africa, and that is the reaction. And so they've suddenly thought, whoa, we've got to bring our house in order in order to be able to have a reasonable status in the world. I wish they would have simply said what they should have said. We respect the rule of law. This decision, which is only an advisory opinion, nevertheless is authoritative. We will bring ourselves into compliance with it. We will leave. We will respect Mauritius's right to sovereignty. We will help the Chagossians to return. We will pay for them to return. We will compensate them for the horrors that has happened to them. And I think that is what they should have done. They haven't done it. They're slowly inching towards doing something, which I welcome. Um, for example, as compared to China and the South China Sea's ruling, I was counsel for Philippines in the case against China. Um, so some credit to them for finally, within three years, it took South Africa 25 years to recognize the decision of the International Court on Namibia and the mistreatment of the Namibian population, apartheid and discrimination and other horrors. Um, so it has changed, but I think that a decent modern Britain would just say, you know what, we fell into error with the benefit of hindsight, we accept that, and we are going to bring ourselves into compliance. But they haven't done that any more than, for example, Mr. Blair hasn't been able to do that in relation to Iraq, which of course is the elephant in the room in relation to Ukraine and makes Britain and America's position so much more difficult and and complicated in relation to what's going on in Ukraine. So the simple point I think is to end, all of these issues are interrelated. There's a sophisticated world out there that understands these points of connections, the complexities and the double standards and the hypocrisies. And it's a long game going forward. Thank you. Can we have a big round of applause, please? We also have a very sophisticated audience who I imagine has some questions. Just in that, like around the world, you've got Iraqs, Irans, uh, Britain, America, Australia, um, and they all have different sort of legal systems. And so when you talk about international law, um, is there a hegemony of British law in international law? And that the way you're thinking about it has that hegemony implicitly embedded in it? <clears throat> That's a really good question. Uh, one of the things that I've thought about a lot over the 13 years that I've been involved in this case and in writing this book is I've gone back to the way I was taught international law. I mean, I had great teachers. 
at university, they were all white British men. So I infused a particular view of international law. And I remember going to the States for the first time as a student in 1983 and, you know, here to speak very frankly, going to a class and a black man taught international law from a very different perspective, from a civil rights perspective. Wow, that was interesting. And that really opened my eyes. And I think since then it's been a sort of, I wouldn't say that it's a struggle because I know what my own views are, but what we learn, what we imbibe, what we drink, nourishes us and gives us a view of the world, which is then very hard to shake off. There's no question that the modern structures of international law reflect, I wouldn't say a British view, but essentially a European and a colonial view with everything that comes with it. And that what we are engaged in now and why this case is so significant is that it's emblematic of an inflection point. This case compares with another case that I described from 1966, when the International Court of Justice was faced by an application from two African countries, Ethiopia and Liberia, to declare South Africa's rule in Southwest Africa, as it was then called today, Namibia, illegal under international law. And the court wiggled out of it, and declined to exercise jurisdiction, an Australian president helped by a British judge, basically manipulating the outcome in ways that I describe in the book as being really inappropriate. And that decision basically said, two African countries have no legal interest in the treatment of Namibians by white South Africa. It really was very shocking for many countries around the world and caused them to say, we don't want anything to do with this sort of white man's court. They said that, it was said very publicly in 66 when the decision came down. And I think this decision in Chagos is a way of bringing that moment to an end and saying, no, we're now in a new place. I think everyone was surprised by the unanimity of the decision. It wasn't split. It was absolutely clear cut. And I think that signals we are in a new place. Now, that doesn't mean that the, you know, way in which the rules of international law have been created are suddenly going to change overnight, but interpretation allows us to take a very different approach. And I think one of the changes that is taking place now is the transformation of the content of the rules to reflect a changed world, a greater diversity. Um, but of course, the structures that we have reflect a particular moment. They reflect 1945. So structure of the United Nations, five permanent members. Why do France and the United Kingdom have permanent members of the Security Council? It's crazy. Sorry, I mean, I know the Kedos say won't like me to say that and Foreign Office won't like me to say that, but it's totally unsustainable. It makes no sense at all. It's completely unjustifiable. And yet it continues because they can't find, can't agree on a different way to do it. So I think we've got a long way to go in transforming this and kernel of real truth in what you say and we need to recognize that and acknowledge it and i think only in recognizing it and acknowledging it do we really begin to change things i remember it i took my students to the court the year before covid actually a couple of years before covid and it was the first year that um the new president of the court, Abdullahi Yusuf, and one of my students asked what his hopes were for his presidency, and I'm paraphrasing, but essentially he said, I'd like the members of the bar who argued before me to be as representative as the judges on the courts. It was a very elegant way of saying, which is had enough of these sort of white boys from Paris, London, and New York, and we took that to heart, and if you look on the video, you won't see it in the transcript, of who argued 
before the International Court of Justice on the advisory opinion on Chavos. In 1966, every single person who argued was a male, and I think pretty much everyone except about two were white. This was complete diversity. It wasn't quite gender balanced, but it was incredibly diverse in terms of how it was run. And my very favorite was um, Council for uh, Council for Botswana. It's a Japanese academic who spoke in French. And I thought that really reflected our world today. It was, I'm told, the first time that a Japanese council has ever addressed the International Court of Justice other than for his or her own country. And I thought that said a lot. He was magnificent. He'd been an opponent of mine in another case for Australia against uh, Japan in the whaling case. And he was just superb. And it, you couldn't really understand why someone like that wasn't arguing before, before the court. And so I think we've got a long way to change the processes, to change the structures, but the rules are inherently malleable. And you, know, you can reinterpret them and apply them in different ways. And I think that's something that's now underway. And this story, this case is a central part of that. And Lisby Elysee, I think, owns this case. It was her voice that transformed this case. And that was why in writing the book, I wanted the first and last word to be her word. It was really complex. We've touched on this, you know, we've touched on this it's sort of indirectly, you know, white guy from London writes story of black lady from Chagos. It's complex. It's, and I, I spoke to a lot of people about that and how one does that. Interestingly, um, when I first conceived of the idea of writing the book and I did a proposal, they went to my English publisher and French publisher and German publisher and Spanish publisher and they all bought it straight away. My American publisher said, no, we can't publish this. It was, I think, 2019. It was right at the heart of the beginning part of Black Lives Matter. We can't have you write this book. Fine, I thought, okay, I respect that. That's your decision. I accept that. I, I, I accept that. They then changed their mind. But I think one has to be really, really sensitive about these issues. This is not my story. This is Lisby Elysee's story and all of the Chagossians who were removed. And when I said to Lisby, I remember telling her this, you know, the Americans wouldn't publish it. She was really upset. She said, well, why not? And I told her why. And she said, um, she said, that's just ridiculous. I can't read. I can't write. I know you. We've worked together for years. Of course, you should write the book. And, and I understood her instinct also. And then I said to her, incidentally, why do you have a portrait of the queen in your house? It's in her name that you were removed from your home island. And she laughed at me, it was about four years ago. And then I saw her in Mauritius in January. Um, as things are changing, she's beginning to prepare to go back. We, we have been back. We made one incredible trip a year ago. And I, and I said to her, as we were dancing the Sega, which is Chagossi music, what about the Queen's portrait? She just looked at me and she said, well. <laughs> Do we have other questions in the room? Hi, uh, thank you. I'm one of these uh, textbook young international lawyers. <laughs> it should be honest, I'm a bit intimidated. But I've been to your Hague Academy course, and I've assisted. You know. And the, the question I wanted to ask you is about the, the formalism in law. For example, once you get the advisory opinion, and then you go to the Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, and the issue is to know if this opinion resolved the issue and if it is binding. And I remember you pleading, saying it is not a lettre ou le néant, it's la vie consultative et le néant, etc., etc., and I remember my professor was pleading against you, and he, he told me if I had had um, German judges, the outcome would have been different. 
and so that that all boils down to what you you are saying right now. It's about the diversity even in international law. I mean, this, because the rules themselves are very malleable. And I remember even the commentaries on this case in the Itlos case. It was uh, mainly about uh, that the argument was really innovative. You had fourteen judges, if I recall, who voted in favor, and one wrote a brief dissent. And how do you explain that? How do you explain this change that is happening and how these legal arguments are removing even illegal arguments from a very formal way of interpreting them to a more open? And how is that reflected in the composition of the courts and tribunals? Just probably for those of you in the audience, one aspect of the story we haven't touched on that you'll just need to understand is that after the advisory opinion came down from the International Court of Justice, I mentioned that one of the four countries that supported the UK and the US for reasons we had no clue about, was the Maldives. Uh, you will not know that the Maldives is the closest country and island to Mauritius, to, to Chagos. And Mauritius, Mal Chagos, has a maritime boundary with the Maldives. So, Mal so we said, okay, we're going to go to the Tribunal for the Law of the Sea and we're going to ask them to delimit the maritime boundary between Mauritius, Chagos, and Maldives. That prompted the reaction we expected from the Maldives, which was to say you don't have jurisdiction because the United Kingdom claims sovereignty and there is a rule in international law that a tribunal will not exercise jurisdiction so long as there is an indispensable third party, in this case, the United Kingdom. And we knew that question was going to come and the Maldives would put that. And that required us to convince the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea in Hamburg the decision of the International Court of Justice was authoritative and dispositive, and that's what they ruled. By eight votes to one, the UK no longer had a claim after the advisory opinion, and it was as good as legally binding. They didn't say it was legally binding as such, but they said it was an authoritative view of the law. But what your professor, who's a fine person, a good friend, um, will understood will have understood is that the way we argued that case was not only about the law you see the textbooks and the teachers mostly say it's all about arguing the law it's not we knew that following the decision in the southwest africa case the global south basically determined pretty much our block it would have nothing more to do with the International Court of Justice. It was a white court and it had behaved outrageously. Then negotiations began in the 1970s for this new obscure convention, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And because the Global South didn't want the International Court of Justice in their lives, they said, well, we'll participate in the Law of the Sea Convention, but only if you create a new tribunal the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea in Hamburg. We want a proper tribunal that's representative of the whole world, that has more judges on it, that doesn't have a guaranteed seat for the five permanent members, blah, 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 so on and so forth. And so the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea came into being as a child of the Southwest Africa case. I knew that. And I knew that because I don't just read my law textbooks. I read history, I read culture, I read you know, race, critical theory, and try to understand the totality of it. And the argument I'm convinced that won at the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea was the simple moment when we said, do you want this to be your Southwest Africa moment? Because if you rule that the ICJ advisor opinion on Chagos has no legal consequences for you, you are dead as a court. And I think many people who were in the tribunal at that point realized at the moment that was said, there was no way the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea was going to rule other than the way that it ruled. In other words, the counsel for the Maldives who advised their client they would definitely win, which is what they advised them, did not step back and ask themselves, what are the optics of ruling against Mauritius in this case? And the simple point is, that judges are not automatons who mechanically apply the law. They're sentient human beings who have a culture, who have an ideology, who have an interest in the well-being of the institution that they sit on. And to have ruled otherwise would have been an act of self-destruction, and they were not going to do that after the Southwest Africa case. So I would say in this particular case, Southwest Africa, is the reason that it changed. 
and Southwest Africa in the context of a composition of a court, which is much more reflective of the cultures of the world than it was in the 1960s. So I think it's a combination of factors. But I think as a law student, the big takeaway is don't expect the rules somehow to just be mechanically applied in a particular way. That's not how it works. There is politics there. There is ideology there. There is personal predisposition there. There's, of course, the law and the facts. You've got to have a plausible basis. But it's a complex and rich experience, the making and the doing of international law. I think that's the reality of it. One more question. Yes. Hey, Philippe, you started one year ago a new fight for the creation of an international court against the crime of aggression against Ukraine. Today, are you hopeful about the creation of this court? Do you think it could happen not too late? Thank you. So one of the things that I've learned in the last few years writing for broader audiences is that actually you really can change things by what you write. This, for an academic international lawyer, comes as a surprise. Um, I noticed that with East West Street and the origins of genocide and crimes against humanity. And I think it was because of East West Street, or Tuha Lemberg, that this Financial Times asked me the day after the war began, the day after the special operation began, to write a piece on Ukraine and international law. And I chose as my topic the gap in the international architecture that there are four international crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and the crime of aggression. And the International Criminal Court could deal with three of them, but it had no jurisdiction to deal with the crime of aggression. And in this case, the crime of aggression was the most important crime because it was the one from which all the other crimes flowed. If there had not been an illegal invasion, we would not have Bucha and Irpin and Mariupol and all these other horrors. Everything stems from the little group that decided to wage that war. And I was appalled, as I think many people are, by the prospect that in three years' time we'll have trials in The Hague at the International Criminal Court of low-grade Russian junior kid soldiers for terrible war crimes and crimes against humanity, but the people on the top table get off scot-free. So the proposal was a simple one. Do what happened in '45: Create a special criminal tribunal. Fill the gap. I did not expect what followed. I did not expect to be contacted by former British prime ministers and Australian prime ministers and, you know, the Ukrainian foreign minister and Mr. Zelensky's office, but it happened incredibly quickly and a core group of countries emerged and the core group got bigger and bigger and various parliamentary assemblies of NATO and the Council of Europe and, and the European Union voted in favor of the idea of a special criminal tribunal. And then in November, France became the first of the big powers to support the idea of some sort of criminal tribunal. And they were then followed by Germany, Britain and the United States. And so now it's going to happen. I'll tell you, it's 100% gonna happen. What remains, is the design of the institution, the nature of the institution, and that's complex. There are a range of different options for doing it. And again, I'm not for a moment starry-eyed. I don't imagine that just because you create a special criminal tribunal for the crime of aggression, all of a sudden, Mr. Putin and Mr. Lavrov and Mr. Shoyu, and I say, oh, we're gonna stop, we give up. That's not what's going to happen. But I go back to what happened. I'm very influenced by the writing of East West Street and the Rat Line. I got, which caused me to look in depth at what had happened, for example, in 1942, January, Declaration of St. James, governments in exile, Charles de Gaulle was amongst them, calling for the prosecution of criminals. And everyone in 1942, January, thought, well, that's a great idea, but it's never going to happen. It's ridiculous. We don't know what's going to happen. When they created the Yugoslav Tribunal, everyone thought, great, terrific, but it'll never get Mr. Milosevic and Mr. Matt, you know, but it did. Today, it doesn't look likely that Mr. Putin will be ensnared, but actually you just don't know. 
what's going to happen. And I think the crucial thing is you stick to your principles, you do what is the right thing, and you create an architecture for dealing with it. I'm not starry-eyed, as I said, and equally, I've already alluded to this fact, there is the great elephant in the room of Iraq and double standards. And why no special tribunal for Syria or special tribunal for Congo? Or, you know, why now all of a sudden the Western countries, because they are under threat, suddenly decide to act? And I accept the force of those arguments, but that's not a reason for not doing it. I accept those arguments completely. I recognize them. And, but it's not a reason for not doing it. So I think I can tell you with pretty much absolute certainty it is happening. What remains is the form, the timing, the place. But there will be a special criminal tribunal for the crime of aggression, and it will be the first time since 1945. So that is a pretty significant development, and we will have to see, you know, how it pans out. I think the reason that it will happen, I mean, this comes back in part to Chagos into the book, is that, and the Amy Cesar quote, you know, what actually do we really care about? Um, and we've got, I think at this point, we, I'm not saying the West is responsible for the horrors that we're seeing, but we did nothing about Georgia. We did nothing about Chechnya. We did nothing about Syria. We did nothing about Crimea. In Britain in particular, we lapped up vast you know, billions of rubles and encouraged Russian oligarchs to come and inhabit our lands. And, and then all of a sudden we realized, huh, we're paying a price for that. And I think a process of reflection and going back to that 1945 moment and realizing its value is a good thing, warts and all. And um, I think we face serious challenges, but it's a way of reconnecting to some essential, some essential values. And I think we have to be big enough in creating these institutions to recognize that equivalent institutions may be used against our countries in the future. You know, I understand the desire to design and create something which immunizes certain countries from such challenge in the future. I mean, it will be reasonable in various capitals to say, well, if they can create a special tribunal for Russia today, why can't they create a special tribunal for us tomorrow? Well, okay, so be it. So let's, let's, let's take that on and let's take it on the chin, but it's going to happen.